morning. Good morning. Oh, thank you for being here on such a gorgeous day. Mm -hmm. so. Please join me responsively in our gathering words. The one who commands the clouds calls us to be poured out for others. We can by faith in the waters of peace, which quench the fires of nature. The one who creates mercy and hope longs for a world of fair play and grace. We can by faith let righteousness and justice be our constant companions. The one who is with us in every moment composes a love song for our hearts. We can by faith teach a song to everyone we meet. Now to our opening prayer. God of the vineyard, plant your passion of justice and righteousness in the soil of our lives, soil of our lives. <clears throat> Prune our thirst for bloodshed and strife from the wild growth of self-interest and greed. Nurture us in this time of worship and make room in our hearts for compassion and generosity. Help us bear good fruit and live as your people a people of passion for justice and righteousness. Amen. Amen.
human, we never find it easy to ask for forgiveness. But as God's children called to live in relationship with one another, we know we must speak on how we have hurt others so we might be forgiven and restored to new life. Jo please join me as we pray, pray to God saying, what more can we say expecting God that you don't already know? You long for the justice of all people, but it is washed away by the flood of violence in our world. You hope that righteousness will walk with us, but we hear the clear cries of those we mistreat. We ask us to speak for those in need, but we shut our minds and turn away. Renew us in our love, Lord, and draw us even closer to you, that we may at last align with your purpose. Have mercy when we do not bear the fruit we could. Even though we have not lived our faith to the fullest, may we live in the promises of hope and grace you have given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. We ask in the name of the one on whom your spirit rests. Amen. My friends, God sees well behind what our human senses can perceive and knows the full truth. And knowing that full truth, still God chose to call us, come among us and reconcile us to the divine heart. Know that God's justice and forgiveness make the impossible possible and then live in the hope of God's kingdom coming among us new, even now. Be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ is not an easy peace. This is not just a peace of embracing those we love, but it is a peace of facing heart truths, forgiving huge sins, and uniting with antagonists across gate divides. Let us extend that peace the one and to one another, just as Christ has extended it to all of us. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Why don't you? Why don't you? All you smart people who can probably teach me more than I know, right? Because you guys know it all. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
Hey, I have a question. I know you've all heard the lesson this morning, so I want to ask something different. So we talk about this thing called stewardship. Do you know what that means? Yes. What? Well, I, I think that's all of it. A garden can be stewardship. You're exactly right. Being kind to others is stewardship. Do we know what it means? Respect to? Very good. It, it, it sort of means that the gifts we have, we take really good care of it. And we share it and we hold it sort of lightly, right? So when we talk about Stewardship Sunday, that means we pledge something. Now, do you know what pledge is? What? Well, the Pledge of Allegiance, but what does pledge mean? Do you know? It's like a promise almost, right? So when we do Stewardship Sunday, we promise to God that we're going to give so much money to help the church, or as I said to all of them, that we might come one night a week to sing in the choir, or maybe we come and we say we're going to teach Sunday school, or we're part of the deacons that take care of the people in the church, or we'll bring cookies on Sunday for people to share while they have coffee. Those are all stewardship things. Excuse me? Yes. I love you. do? I do too. Are you the cookie monster? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so... I know you feel like maybe you don't have too much to give because you just children, right? But sometimes you guys bring the biggest gifts that we can ever ask for in this church. And what do you guys think some of the gifts are that you bring? You just did one of them up there and you didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. What? Peace. Well, you can bring peace. That's exactly right. What's some other gifts we can bring? You guys bring so much joy. Did you even know that? Have you seen how everyone smiled when you were dancing up there? Because you make people so happy. That's a gift all of you have. What other gifts do we have that we can bring before God? That's right. Sometimes we bring food to feed other people. That's a big gift we bring. What else? You can talk to people about God and how much he loves us. You're exactly right. Do you have something that you think we can do to make this world better? You forgot? How about being kind to people? Do you think that's a a good gift to bring to people? Yeah. Or to stand up when someone gets bullied at school? See, we all have gifts. And some of them we bring to church, and some of them we take and we go out into this life and to school, and we just be kind. Or maybe we give someone half of our sandwich because they're hungry. Whatever that might be, we also have gifts, and so we bring them too every day. And you guys, by bringing your gifts, make this world a better place. Just believe me when I say that. Okay? Can we pray? Dear Jesus... Thank you that you love us so much for all the good stuff you give us. Help us to take those gifts and share them with others by being kind or by giving them food or to stand up for them. Help us to love everyone just like you do. Amen. Yeah, but that's for later. First, I've got to do a lot of talking, okay? (laughs) You guys can go back over there. (laughs) Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Teach and help us to respond with our whole being to your daily forgiveness and patience, to the riches of life brought us by Jesus, to the prompting of your Holy Spirit that we may be the people that bear lasting fruits. May we bring to all a justice animated by love.
May we learn to share as you do with us. Amen. So today our first reading comes to us from Isaiah. We'll be reading chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. This is the song of the unfruitful vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it out of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he expected it to yield grapes, and it yielded wild grapes. And now, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the people of Judea, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? For now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that, no, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judea. Are his plant, are, and the house of Judea are his pleasant planting. He expected justice but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This is the word of the Lord.
So our second reading this morning also comes from the prophet Isaiah, just a few chapters on in the book. So there's this gap, but you'll also notice that there's definitely a difference in tone between the two, um, the two passages. What, what Kathy has read talks about the destruction of the vineyard, and then we jump to a text that we know much better for Advent um, about a stump that produces a shoot growing. So it's these two opposite things that sit with us today. Um, so keep that in mind, both the consequences of choices and God's promises as we read this second passage. Let us listen for the word of God as it comes to us today from Isaiah 11 verses, and I'm going to read 1 through 9, even the bulletin says 1 through 5. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse, a branch will sprout from his roots, and the Lord's spirit will rest upon him, his spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of planning and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in fearing the Lord, and he won't judge by appearances, nor decide by hearsay. He will judge the needy with righteousness, and decide with equity for those who suffer in the land. He will strike the violent with the rod of his mouth, and by the breath of his lips he will kill the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness at the belt around his waist. And the wolf will lie down with the lamb, and the leopard will lay down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion will feed together, and the little child will lead them. And the cow and the bear will graze, and their young will lay down together, and a lion will eat straw like an ox. And a nursing child will play over the snake's hole, and toddlers will reach right over the serpent's den. And they won't harm or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. And the earth will surely be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, just as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks now, when I read these two passages... <laughs> it took me a while to figure out how we bring them together. But my first thought on that first one, and maybe this is just me, is it feels much like the times we live in right now. I could sort of identify what's going on, and I think all of us can in some way, because doesn't it feel, is it just me, or so overwhelming these days? It is just like a barrage of continuous being bombarded with images of war and death and violence that is happening in Israel and Gaza, that it continues in Ukraine, that is escalating in Sudan and Yemen, and we can keep on going. And, and, and then if that's not enough, we look at what is happening nationally and we see the increase in discord and civility and, and, and commonality and compassion does not seem to play a huge part in much of the common discourse anymore. And if you're like me, maybe I cannot help but ask at times, where the heck did God go to? Where is God in all of this craziness? Will there ever, ever be peace? And I can do a whole sermon on that. Um, and, then, and then you wonder, can God not do something about this and all the unfairness and the injustice and everything and all people suffering so much? And that is exactly where Isaiah speaks from in our first passage today, all right? This, the place has gone nuts. He's in the southern kingdom of Judah, and in the same time than Hosea we read about last week. They are just northern and southern kingdom, but they live during the same time. And he speaks as he is watching the swords of the Assyrians 
slicing through his native land of Palestine, leaving only a trail of blood behind them and agony as far as the eye can see. He lives through 40 years in which the Assyrian army five times stampede through this hill country of Israel, leaving terror and destruction in its wake. A place where the horrid sounds of war are all too familiar and the cries of pain never end anymore. And so Isaiah writes this. It's called a love song. To me, it feels more like a broken love song. A song sung for a dear friend and his misfortunes with his vineyard. So we learned that during the song, this vineyard owner works tirelessly. He does everything. He takes out the rocks. He prepares the soil. He finds the best vines. He tills. He brings a watchtower and a vat to make wine out of the grapes. Does everything perfect. He cares perfectly just to have these good, sweet, juicy grapes at the end of it. And all he gets for his efforts, I can't remember what was the word that you read. The CEB says rotten grapes. Sorry, I should have paid more attention. The, I think wild grapes, wild grapes, right? The, the Hebrew word for this, this is me on my tangent again, is bebeusham. And that actually means stinky. Not rotten or wild, but the whole mess is stinky. This whole harvest is absolutely worthless. God identifies the rotten and the worthless grapes as their stinky, rancid lives. And God says, I looked for justice, but I saw bloodshed. I looked for righteousness, but I heard cries of distress. Now I'm going to go back to the Hebrew one more time just to make a point. These two words in those phrases are very close. Justice is mishpat. Bloodshed is mishpach. It's only one letter difference. The same on the other side. Righteousness is tzedika. Cries is tziada. It's just... I mean, tziaka, one letter difference again. And as I sat with that, I was wondering if God is trying to say to them, maybe like, what I looked for and what I found may sound alike, might sound alike, but in the real world, they are miles and miles and miles apart. They are opposites. What I looked for was equity among my people and concern for the poor and the marginalized. And I search for wholeness and peace for all my people and in the community. I wanted fruit of compassion and care and justice. Right relationship with God that would spill over into right relationship with all my people. But what I found was greed and self-interest and distortion of my interest and my intentions. Choosing to enjoy the privileges I gave you rather than wanting the best for others. Opposites. And as we keep reading in Isaiah 5, after where Kathy stopped, The picture becomes really clear of what rotten fruit looks like. Greedy accumulation of property that leaves the poor even poorer. Wildly excessive living that wastes resources on a few. And a generally godless living that ignores the work of God in the world. That's sort of a summation of the rest of the chapter. 
They have turned to other gods, the drug of their choice, and have chosen self-indulgence and injustice and violence against the poor and the needy. And then I was wondering what that looks like today. What does the voice of God through the prophet look like in our lives today? The voice of God that looks at the streets in Gaza and Israel and grieves over dying children and women being violated and lives lost and centuries of hatred between Muslims and Jews and Christians. That prophet's voice, it is the voice of God that watches the local news and see protests in front of the capital on the ongoing racial tension in communities, the rampant gun violence, the devaluating of LGBTQ lives. It is the, God, the voice of God that watches over wars or over this world, that watches over the oppression of so many minorities, that watches over corporate executive choosing money and power over justice for starving children. It is the voice of God watching people crossing borders and oceans for safety and climate change reasons and the ways in which they are being treated. It is the voice of God seeing people sleeping on the streets or suffering from curable diseases and illnesses when the world sits idly by waiting for them to pull them up by their own bootstraps. So what does God do? The passage is very clear. Because what does a disappointed vineyard owner do with rotten, stinky grapes? God steps back. It's all that God does. And I believe God steps back and watch with tears streaming down God's face as the devastating consequences of God's beloved's choices rip them apart. God only steps back. God does not cause any of this. We read in Hosea last week that God's heart might be angry, but God never acts on it. Regardless of everything, God continues to love. Because God's intention was always, always to bless their chosen people so that they can bless the world. And so in the end, it's almost as if God says, well, you don't want to do it my way, do it yours. And what we read happens is that Jerusalem finally is destroyed. And people are taken into exile against their will and oppressed for a very long time. That vineyard in which God poured God's all, God's love, God's compassion, God's covenant, and God's promises becomes a stump. What does that story look like for us, I wonder? Are there places in our lives where the harvest is not quite what God expected after showing us nothing but love and grace and compassion? Are we able to trust God enough with the blessings that we have received that we are able to bless the world with it? Or are we extremely comfortable with the systems that have been created for a privileged few in which we live? And what does that look like when we are at this time of year that we once again consider what we give, what stewardship is all about? Not just in money and financial gifts, Sometimes that's easy, but what does it look like for our lives? 
to bear the fruits of justice and righteousness. And then we come to that second passage, and I want to shout from the rooftops, good news. The story does not stop. Stop at a vineyard that is completely destroyed. It's not the final word, my friends. Even when injustice and the pain and suffering that it brings is not the end of the story, because even when it seems like a living nightmare, and there are really no signs of, of peace, and greed is rampant, even then, God's promises are more powerful than humanity's destruction. Do you hear me? God's promises are always more powerful than humanity's destruction. Even then, God's people are not lost forever or completely given to their own devices. Even then, shall God from a stump send a shoot, a king who will bring righteousness and justice back to God's people place where the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the kid will dwell together. And that is good news. It is especially good news for those who have been oppressed and mistreated, for those for whom justice has been denied through selfish cruelty and apathy. I'm not sure what it means for those who sat back in comfort and who benefited from the system of injustice. Because we know that in God's kingdom, everything is turned upside down, right? And those who are at the top will be at the bottom, and those who are at the bottom will be at the top. But in the end, God's unconditional love that brings new growth is always good news even if it does not negate the consequences of our poor choices. We've got to live with them. God, in the end, my friends, got crushed and destroyed just like the vineyard on a cross. Paid the price for us. The shoot is growing up from the stump. Because that is how much God loves us. And this is a promise for all people and for all of creation. A promise where new life starts to show up through the cracks, growing towards the light. And I think if we bring all of this together, this is, in the end, our call. Bearing fruit letting a new growth come up through the cracks and the broken places to find among the decay a tender growth, to nurture it and to tend it, and to allow it to grow and to flourish so the juicy grapes can come for all God's people, so all can feed and drink. We are called indeed, and I think created, to give God existence in the world through our thoughts and our words and our actions, through our work and our voice, through our compassioning and our listening and our hope, and sometimes just our presence. We are called and created to turn towards justice and love and forgiveness. That is what we received from God. So today, as we end the stewardship campaign on grace and gratitude, and we offer up our pledges to the one that has done everything right, who loved us more than we can ever even begin to comprehend. My question is, are we willing to give ourselves 
towards kingdom here on earth. And then I pray that we all may consider carefully what we bring to ensure that God's justice and righteousness and the love of God fills the earth. And that whatever we bring, we bring it because of the grace we have received over and over and over again. Grace instead of destruction. Grace only to bless the world around us. May we do so because that is what God does and because that is who we are, forgiven and blessed and set free to serve. May it be so. you pray with me? Come quickly, Lord, and bring new life out of the roots for looking around. It's easy to think that all is lost. So come and show us a green shoot, a, a sliver of hope, even a possibility that seems completely outrageous. For we are indeed longing for peace founded on justice not just the rebuilding of walls. We are indeed longing for an end to predatory ways and a new community of respect and compassion across all the old boundaries. We are indeed longing for leaders with wisdom and discernment and for truth to be spoken so that all may thrive. So hasten that they, O oh God, when your kingdom is revealed and visible and tangible in this place. In places where justice is replaced with verbal gymnastics and excuses. Where stereotypes determine what people see. And where decisions go with close enough end up hurting our neighbors. May your justice always be on the forefront of our minds and your love the measuring rod for all of our plans. Come quickly, Lord, and make us the small sign of life. Make us the light that shines in the shadows and the vision for another day. Make us to be the peacemakers in places so needed. Be with your children in all its worn, torn places. <laughs> God, I guess all we can ask is that you are present in whichever way or shape or form that may take place and that, and that maybe the green shoots are noticed and that it may give hope. Let us speak into those places. May our compassion and love show people that they still matter. 
We pray for all that we hold dear, those names that were named this morning, for those that always are on our prayer list. You know them. But we also hold some dear in our hearts. And then there are the names that we don't even know, and there, of course, are always the things that is ours and in our hearts. May we find hope, O oh God, in the fact that you do bring a new life and growing edges, even in places where things seem lost. Transform what we seems dead for us and dry into a hope of a new harvest. Change what seems and what we assume is unchangeable and help us to be those agents until your kingdom is present here on earth just as it is in heaven. We ask these and all things in the name of the one who embodies your spirit and truth through us, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The ushers, please come forward. God, in Jesus Christ has given us so much to be faithful for. Our tithes, gifts, and offerings may seem little in comparison to God's gifts to us, but we are called to be faithful over all that we have, our time, our talents, our gifts, and our service. So with thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. For prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. Let us not only bring our offerings, but offer all of us to God.
God gives us starry nights and sunsets that take our breath away. God gives us summer rainstorms and the crunch of fall leaves. We'll start it over. God gives us starry nights and sunsets that take our breath away. God gives us summer rainstorms and the crunch of fall leaves. God gave us New Year's of Life, marked by embarrassing renditions of Happy Birthday in restaurants and the extinguishing of a candle on a glorified pastry. <laughs> God gave us nurses and doctors who cover shots with colorful band-aids and keep lollipops in their scrub pockets. God gave us welcome. God gave and gave and gives and gives. And how do we respond? We, we give what we can. We let it feel like a joy, not an obligation. We let it feel like a gift, not a burden. We show up in this space. We believe these gifts can somehow make a difference and we refuse to give up on this world. Thank goodness for a God that forever outgives. Thank goodness for the opportunity to say thank you for it all. Amen.
I send you out today, I am going to bless the meal so that when you get back there, you don't have to wait until I maybe get back there. So let us bless the meal. Holy God, you bring forth food and drink from the earth to strengthen our bodies and to gladden our hearts. And as we gather around this festive table, we give you thanks for the gift of the meal, for the labor of people near and far who till the land, who tend the fields, who harvest and gather and package and deliver, who cook and prepare the food we will soon enjoy together. May our sharing of this food and our telling of good stories, our laughter around the table, and our memories made be for us a continuation of our prayer, by which join our hearts and souls in saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Amen. And now, there's plenty. Yes. Yeah. And just before you leave, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you all his everlasting peace. Amen. Amen.